I think we all reacted to E3 in different ways. Some thought that it was the best E3 for a couple of years, while others thought that it was a little disappointing. My experience was a little bit... odd. So Rabbit Luigi here using half cover or full cover. And uh, we also have what we call Team Jump. So here, for example, Rabbit Luigi goes into the pipe, out of the pipe, dash the enemy, goes for Mario, Team Jump. First and foremost, this is a project done with passion in our hearts. So it would not exist otherwise, so... I've had a fun week. This character, who is also called Rabbit Luigi, might not be useless, but do you know who else is? By comparison, basically everyone else. Some videos have more contenders to think about than others. Narrowing it down is a tricky job. You have to put up with a lot in video games, but most of the time it comes from problematic bad guys who exist only to make life as difficult as possible. Cuts a little too close to the bone when it comes from the protagonists that you're trying to control, or companions that you're trying to tolerate. I've got enough to worry about. Of course, there's degrees to which a character can be useless, but I think it has redeemable qualities if it's played for comedy. Would you rather have a terrible character who is part of an intricate metagame that they aren't really contributing to, or someone who's just like, nah, I'm comfortable being useless? I contribute YouTube videos to society, I know a thing or two about that. With over 800 of the damn things, the natural deviation in quality of Pokemon is to be expected. This applies both in terms of aesthetic attributes like design, Barbarical still looks like an accident, and viability in battle. Like, some Pokemon were made to be adorable or iconic, and in keeping with their design, they often fall apart a bit when you get into a battle. Nothing wrong with that. Like I said in the beginning, we can only have amazing Pokemon if there were some shitty ones to balance it out. Then again, not every weak Pokemon is surrounded by a bunch of useless lore that attempted to make a terrible idea sound just a little more grand. Back when I was playing Pokemon Gold at the age of roughly five, my first experience of Pokemon at that stage, I was a little bit obsessed with Unknown. Separate forms weren't really a thing in the series at that point, so I had it in my mind that if I caught all 28 different forms, I'd get something special for doing so. That made a lot of sense. I learned disappointment at a very young age. It's hard to see Unknown as anything other than wasted potential. I remember watching the Entei Pokemon movie back in the day when Unknown were being lifted onto a pedestal alongside awesome legendaries who can breathe fire. So they're based on the Latin alphabet, right? Or the alphabet used in the Pokemon world is based on these funky but ultimately useless Pokemon. I don't know, it doesn't actually matter that much. What does matter is the fact that what initially seemed like a highly coveted Pokemon never follows through on that early potential. Collecting all 28 different forms doesn't do anything other than fill a box in your PC with the same Pokemon, and in battle, ah, uh, it only knows hidden power. Really cool move, hidden power. The type of the move changes depending on this craziness, which ends up being an effective way of expanding a Pokemon's type coverage. Not when it's the only move you can learn, though. I didn't expect the alphabet to be overly threatening, but come on now. They'd almost be cute if they weren't so wide-eyed all the time. I know that feeling. Most times in an RPG when your party has temporary characters in it, there's an interesting reason behind it. Effectively, you've got someone who the game didn't want to make a permanent fixture in your squad for whatever reason. Usually because they're the villain or something. But it's one of those unique scenarios that really stand out in a game full of fighting loads of monsters of the same four or five characters. For the most part, Earthbound prides itself on subverting RPG conventions by grounding the whole thing in a more relatable environment, full of normal-looking people and the occasional religious cult. Despite Despite this, very early on in this game, they throw a guest star party member at you before you've really met anyone who's important enough to join you full time. If these are tryouts, Porky isn't very convincing. The good news is that Porky Minch isn't really the sort of person you'd want to spend a game looking after, so getting him out of the way nice and early is the best way to go. He tags along with Ness in the hope of finding his brother Picky, who went missing around about the same time that the meteorite landed nearby. So you drag him around en route to the landing site, but despite following behind you like a party member, he doesn't do any fighting whatsoever. Nah, instead he's thinking to himself, or acting innocent, or playing dead, or even using Ness as a goddamn human shield. 
The practical applications of Porky are kind of lacking and as an introduction to battle mechanics is not as good as it could be, but I feel like that's half of the point. Party member, but not really? It's the modern RPG, every game will be doing this soon. Considering that Porky goes on to become one of the main villains in Earthbound, it's only fitting that your first real exposure to his character traits is him being useless in a fight. It also makes it more personal than when later on he does put up a fight, but it's against you. It's kind of like, where was that when I was getting my eyes pecked out by crows? He's only useful when he's fighting me. In a post-apocalyptic world full of hostile monsters and radioactive wastelands, any help you can get is going to be valued quite highly. Bethesda like to promote this idea of the protagonist in Fallout games being the Lone Wanderer, or at least in Fallout 3. But the community side of these games means that you've got enough interesting people around you to never feel alone for a noticeable length of time. You know, it isn't just about shooting giant bugs or blowing up things with nukes. You're going to be rubbing elbows or pressing flesh with all manner of sidekicks who may or may not be helpful to you. Do you know how helpful Preston Garvey is in Fallout 4? Helpful wouldn't be the word I use. Even though he's one of the first important characters you meet in Fallout 4, the usefulness of Preston Garvey both in normal gameplay and the wider story flatlines very quickly. His role in this world is to be an NPC for the player to come back to when they want to expand their settlement empire, which is the kind of side quest that started off exciting as you journey from one shithole to the next fixing problems, only for the fun to wear thin when you realise there's 37 of these in the game and I don't care that much. And yet Preston Garvey keeps spouting off about another settlement that needs saving whenever you get within earshot and how the farmer's wife has been kidnapped again. Let me mark it on your map. But hang on, didn't you make me a general a little while back? Yeah, you did. And yet you're still sending me off into the world looking for random spots of land. I come back every time expecting some kind of congratulations and every time it's just nope, more settlements. Technically you can recruit him as a companion, but a dog can do that job. And dog meat doesn't care if you turn out to be a maniacal madman, he'll still love you. It's settlements all the way down. Generally unlocking a new playable character is something to be celebrated, not quite in a shout it from the rooftops kind of way, but it's a nice little reward that celebrates your gaming achievements. But don't rule out the possibility of a joke character in there somewhere. He's only there to ruin your day. For the longest time, I didn't even know that Super Meat Boy had more than one playable character. Before I played it, the only footage I saw of the game showed Meat Boy darting his way through levels, and by the time I bought it for myself, I never really got enough bandages or beat those funky retro levels to play as anyone who wasn't a sentient mass of muscle tissue. It isn't something you have to worry about too much. The levels are built around how Meat Boy controls, and not so much the abilities of someone who can float or jump in mid-air. There's even a hidden character in the PC version who can't jump very high or move very fast. He's made of tofu. That's fucking hilarious. The story goes that our old tone-deaf vegan friends Peter made Super Tofu Boy to promote the benefits of vegetarianism over the abusive tyranny of eating meat. Social politics, probably not worth dwelling on, mainly because I don't care. But it's an equally scathing and terrible parody. Something tells me that Peter should spend more time screaming into the ether than trying to make video games. But into the picture rides Team Meat, who see the potential for Tofu Boy as a playable character in the OG game. Which is why you can type in the code PETERFILE, did you know that Subtle has a silent B? At which point you can play through any level in the game as a character who moves very slowly and can barely jump. Tofu Boy can't even beat the first level. I should say at this stage that tofu isn't bad as long as you cook it with something that has a lot of flavor of the tofu to soak up. But as a heroic protagonist, one step at a time. I think Bethesda games are set up better than most for exposing the player to useless characters, pretty much only because there's so many of them. It's kind of like the Pokemon argument, you can only have this level of variety if some of them are actually useless in every way. For every great companion or follower in the Elder Scrolls games, you have to have someone terrible who you drag behind you like some kind of underpaid babysitter. If you're talented enough to become the grand champion of Oblivion's arena, you get a decent load of money, some sweet loot, and endless appreciation of your abilities. You also get a follower. 
He likes you. The adoring fan is unsurprisingly, given your spectacular battle prowess and the name that Bethesda decided to give him, a little obsessed with you. Nothing wrong with a bit of healthy obsession, but unfortunately for this guy, when he asks if he can join you on all of your questing, there's an option to say yes. You know Incrediboy from The Incredibles, how he's all like, oh gee, can I tag along with you, my one true idol? And he gets shot down pretty spectacularly. It's kind of like that, except you can easily say, sure, come fight weirdos with me. Never really mind that he's not really equipped to go adventuring, and that the adoring fan is physically incapable of doing anything practical other than hiding from enemies and dying like a bitch. At least he's enthusiastic. In the end, you don't bring the adoring fan along to get anything useful done. I guess he makes for a pretty outstanding cheerleader who borders on incredibly annoying 90% of the time, but sometimes you need a bit of that to get you through the hard times. Through some miracle, the adoring fan is cursed to respawn from death every three days like some kind of crazy Majora's Mask thing. This means that your time with the adoring fan is more a case of finding creative ways to kill him and using his deaths as a way of lifting your morale. It's a tale of finding use in something useless. We have so much to learn. This is Rumble Luigi, and it may seem a little bit pointless, but the story of the adoring fan is a useful lesson about the dangers of fame and trying not to exploit it from either perspective. You might be willing to ride into battle under the name and the flag of someone you idolize, but you can't do that without first thinking about all the problems that may come with it. It is a story that we shouldn't forget. We have to always remember this. Especially me. <laughs> because I'm in a fucking video game now. Have you got an idea that you'd like me to turn to a countdown? Let me know in a comment down below, and make sure you check out my Twitter, where I'll be turning the best submissions into a poll, where you can then decide the best topic. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.